excited because we're starting today a series on worship, created to worship. I'm going to do these first two Sundays, and Pastor Carl's going to do the next two Sundays. And I brought my water up here in case I find myself in the desert place, like it was talked about on the song. But I'm so excited about worship because years ago, I realized, and I was, my life was opened up by a, a lime green book called Let the Nations Be Glad by John Piper. Has anybody ever seen that book or read that book? It used to be lime green. They've got a new cover on it. It looks a lot nicer now. It looks more modern. <laughs> but I remember him, and it was a book about missions. Let the Nations Be Glad, it was called. And he, but he laid out how worship was all over the Bible. Glorifying God is all over the Bible. It is the motivation for doing everything. We are, in our lives, we are to be motivated by the glory of God. And I was, my mind was blown. You know, when you open up the Bible, you will see worship everywhere you look. Virtually every page is just filled with some reference to bringing glory to God, which is what worship is, expressing your love to God. Uh, but worship is everywhere. Adam and Eve walked with God. Cain and Abel's big conflict was over worship. Uh, Noah, when he landed the ark, and he, the first thing he did when he got out on dry land was he built an altar to worship God. Uh, I'll go faster. King David, <laughs> King David had... Uh, had the ark that he danced before. Uh, Solomon built a temple. Oh, I forgot Moses, who, leading the children of Israel, he had the, the tabernacle, and they set up all the 12 tribes around the tabernacle, so that would be the center of their lives. Worship would be the center of the children of Israel's lives. And on and on and on, you can see when they in, when the divided kingdom, when people would start to rebel, they would start to get false, false gods idol worship, all these things, and, and the Bible is just saturated with the concept of worship. Sometimes it's stories of when it went right, and sometimes it's stories of when it went really wrong. In, um, in, when, when they came back from exile, they built a temple. When Jesus came, the shepherds came to, to see Jesus, and when they left, they said they were praising God and telling everybody around. And then the wise men come after that, and the wise men, what did they do? They brought offerings, and they bowed before and worshiped the Christ child. And it's just everywhere. Paul and Silas are out on a missionary journey. They get thrown into the dungeon and chained up, and what are they doing about midnight? In the darkest part of the night, it says that, Paul and Silas were singing hymns to God. I just love that. That's one of my favorite. That's one of my favorite stories when Paul and Silas were there and they were worshiping. Of course, the book of Revelation is filled with worship. Worship is the central theme of the Bible and it needs to be the center of our lives. We were created to worship. That is why we are here. Isaiah 43, 7 says, everyone who is called by my name whom I created for my glory. Look at that middle line. I created for my glory. You've been created for his glory and whom I formed and made. We were created to bring glory to God. We were created to worship. And now, isn't this a lovely setting here? This middle, set, this middle uh, panel is a door. And I've, I've put some goodies back here. I've got a, a little prop I'm going to bring out. Let me see what I have here. First service, the door didn't work, but this service, it did. Yes, look at there. This is a non-exact replica of my little puppy, Esther. In February, my wife surprised me with a puppy. Uh, it was kind of a Valentine's Day thing, and I got a little puppy named Esther. She is a soft-coated Wheaton Terrier, and she is, we just love her to death, but she is a chewer. Puppies are chewers. They chew everything. They just chew and chew. There's something about it. There, there's something about, I guess, the pain that they have in their little puppy teeth, and they got to chew. They got to chew, chew, chew. They just chew everything. She will chew leather. She will chew plastic. She will chew metal. She just chews and chews and chews. She will chew grass. She will chew the desk. She will chew your shoe. She will chew uh, your Bible. She will chew Mitch's very expensive Apple AirPods. She just chews and chews and chews. Little Esther is a chewer. 
That's what she does. And I love her to death. And if you want more adventures of Mitch and Esther, just follow me on Instagram. My story is filled, <laughs> filled with little videos of my beautiful little dog, Esther. And how Lisa named, came up with the name Esther because she's like the queen of our house. And she's come for such a time as this. And, it, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> anyway, anyway, Esther is uh, a chewer. In the same way that Esther is a chewer, people are worshipers. We are always worshiping something, whether it is the right worship or it is very wrong worship. Um, we worship either God, the true God, the fountain of living water, or we are over, uh, worshiping idols. After Moses led the children of Israel out of Egypt, God said, lead them out of Egypt so that they can worship me on this mountain. And Moses was like, right, we'll do that. And, and he did everything and he brought them out there, brought them to the mountain. Moses went up to the mountain God's making these tablets with the Ten Commandments on it. You've seen the movie, right? You all saw the Charlton Heston movie. And while he's up there, what happens? But the children of Israel are like, what happened to Moses? We got to worship. We got to worship. And there's no Moses, so we don't know what to worship. So what did they do? They created a calf, a gold calf, an idol. And it seems ridiculous, but I, I have that on the, the screen. Exodus 32 says, now when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people assembled about Aaron and said to him, come, make us a God who will go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up from the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. <laughs> we, do know what, we do not know what has become of him. You know, really people? Really? The same guy who came in, who, who, who led you through, who released you from the most powerful man on earth for the Pharaoh, the one who was there who God used to bring plagues on Egypt, the flies and the gnats and all the 10 plagues. And then he brought you through and then you got to the Red Sea and he parted the Red Sea and, and Moses was just the servant of the Lord, but they parted the, God parted the Red Sea with Moses and then they kept going and they were out of, there was no water and he found water from a rock. Moses is doing all this stuff over and over and, and then he's gone up to the mountain to get the t Ten Commandments tablets and, and they're like, we do not, do, we do not know what has become of him. And, and they got impatient. They're like, Aaron, we got to have this gold calf. Worshippers sometimes can so easily be distracted by idols. Um, give us something else to worship. We must worship. We are worshipers. And so Aaron gave him that golden calf. And, and, and that sounds silly to us, doesn't it? Why on earth would anybody care about a golden calf, much less bow before it and, and worship it and celebrate it? But really, we center our lives today around other things, don't we? Um, we center our lives maybe around jobs. Oh my goodness, what is it that is occupying your time? What is it that, that your life is centered around? Is it your business is it your job? Oh, or can I get that next job? Or maybe some of us center our lives around sports. Oh my goodness, what's going to be the next thing on TV? Is it March Madness or is it uh, football playoffs? Uh, oh, the Huskers, what are the Huskers doing now? Oh, it's football. Oh, it's basketball. Oh, it's whatever. I got to do my next sports thing. Sports, sports, sports is all I can think about. Or maybe it's television or maybe it's your relationships. I got to get me a husband got to get me a husband. That's all I can think about is getting me a husband. Or, or a wife, men are just as bad. Uh, I got to have, that's the only thing you think about. What can I do? Or maybe you have children and your mind is consumed with what those children are doing. And how can I do this and that to make sure my children do the right thing? And, and oh my goodness, I'm worried about my children. Where did my children go? How can I, how can I serve my children? Children, children are, are way up there. Or some people, it's their phones, right? <laughs> my phone, oh my glorious phone. I cannot be separated from my smartphone. I must have it. If I do not have it, I will be bored at some point and that would be terrible. I have to have my game. I have to have my Instagram. I have to have everything that this phone brings me. And they center their lives around this. I say they, we. <laughs> we center our lives around these things. And and we have the same attitude that the people of the Bible used to have toward idols. We have it toward these, these other things. We just 
Say, oh great and valuable thing, I give you my full attention. I center my life around you, most glorious and awesome thing. And uh, because we're worshipers, it's because we're worshipers. We're always worshiping. We're always giving our attention to something. We're always ascribing glory to something or someone. So my question for you is, who or what are you worshiping? What gets most of your attention? Where is your mind drifting? Maybe right now, where is your mind drifting? You know, where does your mind just naturally go? Does it, is it filled with God and what can I do for God or how can I bless God or why does God have me here at this moment right now? Or is it just plain on something that becomes an idol? Turn in your Bibles to Hebrews 13. Hebrews 13, and we're going to look at just two verses, and we're going to stay there so you can keep your Bibles open to Hebrews 13, verses 15 and 16. In the old days, it used to be so nice to hear the rustling of the, the, rustling of the pages, right? Now all of you with your phones, I get to see the warm glow of God's Word on your faces. It's wonderful. <laughs> but if you would go there, Hebrews 13, and uh, verses 15 and 16. It says, through him then, and that's Jesus. Actually, I memorized this verse years ago in a different translation, in the New International Translation, and it actually says, through Jesus therefore. But here it says, through him then. Through him then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is, the fruit of lips that give thanks to his name. And do not neglect doing good and sharing, for with such sacrifices, God is pleased. What's the first thing we see on ver- in, in uh, point one is that our worship must be gospel-centered. Through Jesus then, through Jesus then, the book of Hebrews, this is, comes in the last book, uh, the last chapter of the book of Hebrews, and most of the first 12 chapters are all about Jesus how Jesus came, Jesus, Jesus like is the one. He, he replaces, he is our high priest. He is the perfect sacrifice. He is greater than Moses. He is the one sacrifice once for all. And so then they get and they have some other things in 11 and 12 and then in 13 he says, through Jesus therefore, okay? <laughs> through Jesus therefore, this perfect lamb of God, through him, uh, the, he is the center the gospel-centered worship, centered on Christ, the one who paid the penalty for our sins, who conquered sin and death. You know, the gospel is that, that sin has separated us from God. We were created to be with him. We were created to worship him, to be with him, but, but then we sinned and sin has separated us from God. And the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. So we have this thing hanging on us, death. We have this penalty, death. Jesus said, I'm going to come live a perfect life, and I'm going to give you, the, and I'm going to die for your sins. And if you just receive, if you just receive the gift of salvation I'm offering to you, then you can live with me forever. That's why he's called the Savior, because he saves us from the penalty of our sin. <clears throat> Christ must be the center of our worship. And the cross of Christ his shed blood on the cross, his resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ must be the center of our worship. He is the center of history, and he must be the center, center of our worship. That's the good news. That is the gospel. He offers us that gift. And the only reason we can approach God is because of Jesus. He is the reason that he, he, he bridged that gulf that sin created. He bridged that gulf so that we could be united with with God, and he has authority. He has the authority of God the Father. You know, I, we, we get this authority thing, don't we? we? Sometimes we pray around here. Well, we, about every time when we pray around here, we finish the prayer with, in Jesus' name, amen. Why do we pray in Jesus' name? Because Jesus has authority. Jesus is the only reason that God should even listen to our prayers. We have nothing in ourselves to be able to offer to God. But because of Jesus, 
Because of Jesus, we get to pray. A lot of times I'll say that, won't I? In Jesus' name, we get to pray. And we're so thankful for Jesus because of him. We understand this authority thing, don't we? Because we got that when we were kids, right? When a kid, when a little brother says to a big brother, uh, you can't have any ice cream before dinner. The big brother says, who says? And the little brother says, mom says, right? How much authority does the little brother on his own have over the big brother? Hold up the universal symbol of how much authority a little brother has over a big brother in, when it comes to ice cream. He has none. But little brother's just loaded with authority when he knows Mom says, because mom has the authority, right? Mom has the authority in all matters of ice cream and about everything else in the home, right? Mom has authority. In the same way, Jesus Christ has authority. It is in his name. Our worship must be gospel-centered, all the time focused on him. He paid the penalty for our sins. He conquered sin and death. And when we pray, we pray in Jesus' name. Our worship is centered around the gospel of Jesus Christ. The second thing, worship always involves a sacrifice. It always involves a sacrifice. It says, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. In Old Testament worship, they would always have an offering, right? They would, uh, like in tabernacle worship or in temple worship, they'd be bringing their offering to God. Maybe they'd, uh, they'd have especially poor people maybe would have some wheat or they might bring some oil or people who had a little more means, they would have, they'd bring a sheep or a goat or maybe a young bull. Sometimes I just imagine that, you know, what if those sheep knew what they were getting into? You know, the sheep are about to be slaughtered when they get there, right? And they're just dragging that, dragging that lamb, you know, that lamb's like digging in like, like little Esther does sometimes when she doesn't want to go where I'm taking her. She's scared and she drags, and they have to drag that lamb and they have to bring that sacrifice of, of, of that, that lamb. I always wonder when you guys are coming, when we're all coming to worship, sometimes I will picture you dragging something. <laughs> what is that lamb that, that, that these people are dragging today? And because I'm a pastor, sometimes I know. Sometimes I know that the kind of week that you had. And sometimes I, I always pray for your prayer requests. All of us pastors do. And so we know the kinds of things that you're dragging in when you have to come. Because uh, worship involves a sacrifice. Many of you are short on time. Time is, oh my goodness, I have so many irons in the fire. I have not enough hours in the day to do everything that I've made a commitment to. And you are dragging that lamb of time of two hours time, one hour time, two hours time to come to the service and say, God, I'm here for you. I'm dragging that lamb. Some of you are, are emotionally tired. You're just spent emotionally. You've had just a gut-wrenching, heart-wrenching week or month or longer, and you are dragging that lamb, and you are coming in and you're saying, God, this time is for you. This time is for you because I'm committed to you, and this is my sacrifice. Drag that lamb drag that lamb or, or maybe your finances are stretched and you're just you are just really stretched thin but yet you drag that lamb of commitment to God and you bring that sacrificial gift and you drag that lamb in here and you sacrifice uh, God loves sacrifice some, some of us need to sacrifice our, uh, our Saturday night some of us uh, miss Sunday morning because Saturday night got a little out of hand uh, I don't know what it is, but they, whatever, they stayed up late, and, and some of us just need to sacrifice Saturday night and make sure we get to bed, you know? Saturday night is a great night to figure out what you're going to wear the next day for church, <laughs> put it in the bathroom all ready to go so that in the morning you're not going, what, it, what socks am I supposed to wear? Oh, no, I miss church again. Get ready on Saturday night. Go to bed early on Saturday night. If Saturday Night Live is your favorite show, just don't watch it or get a DVR or something. Don't stay up late if it's going to make you miss Sunday morning, okay? Sacrifice. Drag that lamb of time. Drag that lamb and offer that sacrifice of praise to God. Number three, God loves our worship. He loves it. Isn't that weird? That is a humbling thing to know that God actually loves it. You love it? God, I have a 
terrible voice and I have a ter- did a terrible things this week. And I know a lot of people don't realize, but I love that how it says the fruit of lips that give thanks to his name. Everybody likes fruit, right? Everybody can think of at least one fruit. Raise your hand if you can think of at least one fruit you like. Oh, yeah. It doesn't say the vegetables, right? Because there's a little... A lot of people would be like, I don't like vegetables. But everybody likes fruit, right? The fruit of lips that confess his name. He loves, 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 loves our worship. You know, there's an age-old question about worship. Who is worship for? Is worship for people or is worship for God? Now, pray that I don't get in the weeds here. Say, just say a little prayer to yourself. Lord, help him. Don't let him get in the weeds. But there's that issue. Is it for God or is it for people? Um, because, because God, on the one hand, God doesn't have any needs, right? He's fine. He's perfect. He's awesome. He's holy. There's no one like God. He doesn't have actual needs. He doesn't have a need. He doesn't need our worship. On the other hand, people are worshipers. We should always have an attitude of giving, Giving him glory, not looking at what I get out of it, but be givers, right? And so you've got this kind of tension, who is worship really for? And maybe all of you already know this, but can I just tell you, it's really for both. It's for both. Now, people need to come with an attitude of giving. We are here to give a sacrifice of praise. We are here to give the fruit of lips that confess his name, right? And we are to be focused on him. And God knows that the best worship is worship that is centered on him. Um, back Back to Esther. You don't remember Esther the dog? Esther, one time recently, she got really sick. And, uh, I'm not gonna gross you out, but she threw up and there was weird stuff in there. Because Esther, I mentioned, she'll eat plastic, she'll eat metal, she'll eat everything. And anyway, there was weird stuff in there. She got sick. And I just, it just made me sad because I'm always trying to give Esther good things, right? I've got, we spend far too much money on the puppy food we get Esther. Oh my goodness. (laughs) Because we want Esther to have the best stuff. And when she is chewing those bad things, we always take them away from her. Don't, don't do that because you're probably going to eat that. You're going to consume that. I want good things. I want good things for Esther, not weird things. I want what's best for my dog, right? And you know where I'm going with that. God wants the best for us. He wants us to be coming to him. He is the one. He knows that there is no joy in our idols. He knows that he is where our joy is. He knows that he is the fountain of living water. He is the one we should worship. Just talking about water makes me thirsty. He wants us to, the only one who is truly good, worship can be both. And as for the mature, the more mature you are, the more you understand that God wants his glory spread. God wants the best for us. So we don't come with an attitude of what can I get out of it in a selfish way. But yet we know, the more mature we are, we know that when we give, when we come with that attitude, we become a more generous person. We become the kind of person who's centered around the one who we should be centered around. And we become better people. That's one of the things about parenting, isn't it? You raise it. You have a kid. You bring him home from the hospital and you go, I have no idea what to do with this baby. I mean, what in the world? I mean, I know maybe half the stuff, but the other half, you're just winging it. Aren't we parents? Can I get a witness? All right, you guys all knew what you were doing, but I had no idea. I'm just glad I had a good wife. She knew what she was doing. And you're, th- and you're raising these kids and you're thinking to yourself, I sure hope they don't end up being jerks. You know, like I was. You know, I don't want to, nobody wants to raise a jerk, right? And when you raise these kids and, and you see these good things happening, what joy that brings to your heart to know that, oh my goodness, how did I do this? Uh, by the grace of God and by a great wife, I ended up with these great kids who are generous, loving, kind people. They are not jerks. They're wonderful people. And that's what God loves. He loves to see us growing and maturing and becoming more like him as, as we grow and mature. And we finally, the more we mature, we realize, hey, yeah, 
I'm getting something out of being a giver. You, you get to a certain age when you think, uh, wow, Christmas is more fun. I, I'm looking more forward to what I'm going to give than what I'm going to receive because we become that kind of a person, a generous, loving, giving person. Um, sometimes people, I hear, hear people who think, why would God, God want my worship? You know, and they're like, Hi, I know, Mitch, you say God loves worship and the fruit of lips that thank his name, but I really, I really have done some bad things in my life. I'm really not right. And uh, my past is just a mess. And, and, and even on the super, not superficial, that's a bad way to say it, but even on the surface level, I'm not even a bad singer, you know? Why would God want me to sing when he can have so-and-so over there who's a great singer be singing? I think I'll just check out this week and let somebody else bring their praise because God doesn't really miss my praise anyway, right? Has anybody ever thought of that? I, I got to tell you, I have a story because this hit me and you're not going to, you might not believe this because it's actually an insecurity that I had over something I'm actually kind of good at. It's kind of weird, but because um, I really have two talents. Um, I can sing and I'm quick to smile. Those are my two talents and it's gotten me this far, so... Uh, thank you, Lord. <laughs> thank you. Anyway, I, I can sing. And, and one time years ago, before we had kids, Lisa and I were in Nashville. And we were touring uh, downtown Nashville, doing all these touristy things. And we went to a place that was a studio that, that made music recordings. And we went into that place and, uh, you know, they could show you how to do it. And I'm sure all the all the technology is different now than it was back then, but we had these big earphones on and we would sing with these big fancy mics and they could do all kinds of things with the mic and blah, blah, blah. It was really cool. We enjoyed it. Uh, we're music people. And Lisa says, hey, look, you can get, uh, we can make a recording and we could give it to our moms for Christmas. And I remember thinking, who in the world would want that? I, why would anybody want a recording of me singing for Christmas? And plus, doesn't that kind of say, I think I'm a great person, a great singer or whatever? But I just, I just did not, I was not comfortable with it. I was like, who would want it? Lisa says, well, my mom would love it. And I thought to myself, yeah, my mom probably would like it too. So we made it. And we gave it to Lisa's mom for Christmas, these, this recording, this little cassette tape of us singing in Nashville. And she was so happy to get that gift. And I was like, yeah, well, Merry Christmas. And, she, and I, thought, I thought in the back of my mind, this thing's going to end up in a drawer somewhere and never be seen again. And we visited about, I can't remember how long after that, six months, a year, I don't know, we, maybe sooner. And we were in the living room, and Lisa's mom was in the kitchen making dinner, and what do I hear coming from the kitchen? My voice singing that I'd record in that, recorded in Nashville. She was listening to it, and we said, oh, mom, you're listening to this. I'm thinking, she says, oh, yeah, I, I play this all the time. I love it. I love it. And, I, and I'm thinking, who is like that? Who likes this stuff? And I'll tell you who likes it, and you all know, you're all way ahead of me. Moms. Moms love it. Moms love us. Moms love everything about us. Moms love the fact that we went to all the trouble to make a song for them. Moms, my mom, and my mom loved it too. Her mom loved it. And I was just thinking, uh, isn't that kind of like God? You know, we are bringing our offering. We are bringing what we have. God, my, my offering check is a lot smaller than most people's, I'm sure, but it is my, my offering. Here it is. And, uh, and you know what? God, is, God loves it. God loves it. You are singing a song, and you're like, I sound not nearly as good as the person sitting next to me, but you know what? God loves it. God loves it. He loves that you are coming and you're glorifying him. He loves that you're centering your life around him. He loves that you are focused on being a worshiper of the one who is most worthy of, of worship. Yeah. Uh, he's transforming us, and he loves that. He loves to see us transformed. 
All right, number four, worship continues between Sundays, between Sundays. Verse 16 says, and do not neglect doing good and sharing, doing good and sharing, for with such sacrifices, God is pleased. This is the other part of worship. We are to worship every single day. Worship does not start when you hit that door. Worship does not start when you find your seat. Worship does not start when they strike up the first note for you to sing. Worship is continual. Worship goes on and on between Sundays. Do not neglect doing good and sharing for such sacrifices. Those are also sacrifices. For such sacrifices, God is pleased. Bringing honor to God by serving others, by doing good and sharing with such sacrifices, God is pleased. Uh, I've got another little uh, prop in my drawer. Were you just falling asleep, wondering what else I got in my, my, behind my door? Uh, yes, this is time for that. Let's see what I got here. It's yellow. What, what is this? Someone. It's a, yeah, I'll call it a strainer. You could call it a something else. But it's, and you can tell that it is my strainer because it's been chewed by my puppy. Uh, I, this strainer, you, you put your spaghetti in there or whatever and the water strains out and you get to keep the spaghetti, right? That's, that's a strainer. That's what you get to use. I'm calling this my does it bring glory to God grid, okay? It's, it's got a, doesn't that have a nice ring to it? The, my does it bring glory to God grid. Does it bring, say it with me. My does it bring glory to God. Yeah, good. You're catching right on. It's just snappy. I'm going to get brand that so nobody steals it. My does it bring glory to God grid. When you have to make a decision, always run it through your yeah, does it bring glory to God, Grid? This will help you um, to not neglect the doing good and the sharing that is, in that, that is in that verse. There are so many things we can do with our time, talent, and treasure. We need to run everything through this grid. Keep it handy, okay? Keep your grid handy. Use it every day for big decisions, for little decisions. Should I reach out to that new kid at school? Oh, there's a new kid at school. Should I reach out to that kid? Should I maybe go over and let that new kid know that I'm there for them, you know, that if, if they need a friend, I'll be their friend. Well, you see, should I do that? Should I reach out to the new kid? Let me pour it through my does it bring glory to God grid. Shh. Is that something that is doing good and sharing? Oh, yes, it is. That's a good thing to do. I think I'll do it. Does, run it through your does it bring glory to God grid. Should I help Pastor Shane in the children's ministry? Run it through the does it bring glory to God grid and think, oh my goodness, I do care about children. I, I want children to learn the word of God. I want them to know that they are loved. I think I will. Or maybe I am terrible with children. Children run and scream when they see me coming. That does not bring glory to God, so maybe I shouldn't be doing that. But uh, run it through that. Should I invite my neighbor to church? Run it through the grid. Should I call my grandma today? Hmm. I think I'll run it through the does it bring glory to God grid. Yes, it does. It brings great glory to God. That is doing good and sharing. Should I have three desserts at lunch today? Does that bring, no, that does not. Bring, <laughs> I know you were hoping I'd say the other, but no, it does not. What school should I go to? What job should I take? Does it bring glory to God? Always run it through the does it bring glory to God grid. Every week. Here at Calvary, we, in this series, we're going to talk about the importance of worship. And most of the time, we're going to think about this gathering right here, the service. But between Sundays, you should be bringing glory to God in every way you can. As I said, worship doesn't start when your car hits the parking lot. Worship continues. And those who are really focused on bringing honor and glory to God are running things through their grid and they are living lives that are pouring out, that are sharing, that are doing good. What can you do to do good and share with others? About a year ago, sorry about that, I'm really feeling dry today. You guys don't mind that I didn't get you one, do you? Okay, <laughs> good. Um, about a year and a half ago, Lisa's mom, her health was failing, 
and she was going downhill uh, pretty fast. She had, uh, there's these different, um, oh, and by the way, these guys are going to start coming up and playing and getting ready to lead us in worship. This is the last kind of thing. She was declining in health, and um, I remember we went up there one day, and uh, we always go, it was a Sunday, and so we always have to wait till after church. By the time we got to Fremont, which is where she lived, she was in the hospital in Fremont, um, her sister and brother and dad had all gone to lunch. It was just Lisa and me. I remember going into that room, and at this point, Lisa's mom could just kind of open her eyes. She knew you were there. She could say a couple of words, oh, Lisa's here, that, that kind of thing, just short sentences. She was at that point. And I remember we went in there. I'll tell you, it was one of the most holy moments I can ever remember being a part of. We went into that hospital. The lights are kind of dim. Lisa pulls out her Bible, and she just read the Bible to her mom. And we prayed for her mom. And we started to sing some songs to her mom, some of her favorites, some of, uh, you know, Great is Thy Faithfulness. You know, she was a farm wife, so she loves that summer and winter and springtime and harvest, right? <laughs> she loves that, uh, her mom does. And so we would sing these songs. She was a Lutheran. She loved in the Lutheran hymnal, Children of the Heavenly Father. You know that song, Safely in His Bosom Gather, it says. It's a great song that a lot of times they'll sing in at funerals because it's about how God welcomes them into his bosom. And uh, I'll tell you, it was moving. And when I think of a holy moment in my life, I think of that. And it was not inside these walls. It was out there in another place that we could do good and we could share and we could be worshipers in a positive way for somebody else and help them. Um, it was a holy moment. And I was, uh, these guys are going to lead us in some songs. And this first song they're going to do um, would have just been a perfect song to sing to Lisa's mom because it talks about, I'm no longer a slave to fear, right? And when you're close to death, there is some fear. You know, a lot of times people, Lisa's mom really. Uh, her desire to go had outweighed her fear at this point. She was just ready to go. But, but I'm no longer a slave to fear. I'm a child of God. I'm just about ready to see him, you know? And then we, he split the sea so I could walk right through it. My fears are drowned in perfect love. That's what, her fears were just about to be drowned in perfect love. And uh, we got to minister to her that way in a beautiful way. And you guys can do that too. So this series. It's a lot about what happens in this room, but I'll tell you what, it is a lot about what happens outside of Sundays, how we're going to go from this place, and we're going to glorify God in everything we do wherever we go. Stand with me, and these guys are going to lead us, lead us in worship.